Okay, I'm Rex Malmstrom and I'm a scientist at the JGI. I'm hosting today's session. And today we're gonna discuss how, well, at least discuss an opportunity for drawing on the resources of NEON, the, excuse me, the National Ecological Observatory Network and drawing on these resources as part of a collaboration with EMSL and JGI. Our goal today is to provide an overview of NEON, uh, those resources and how you can access them in order to advance your own research. We're gonna collect questions that you send, that you can send, us, send to us through the Q&A feature. We're gonna collect those as we go and then answer them at the end of today's presentation. So please just send them through the Q&A function. Uh, we're also going to record today's session, we're going to record these questions, and we're going to provide a, a recording online as well as written answers to the questions that we received for, for people who couldn't attend live. So uh, really quickly though, just about us, the Joint Genome Institute is a U.S. Department of Energy user facility. We're located at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. We're world leaders in the genomics of plants, fungi, algae, and complex environmental microbiomes. And we help researchers characterize these organisms in these communities and how they carry out complex biogeochemical processes and how we might use these organisms for sustainable biofuels and bioproducts. And at the JGI, we have expertise in DNA and RNA sequencing, DNA synthesis, metabolomics, and data analysis. The Environmental Molecular Science Laboratory, or EMSL, is another DOE user facility, and they provide integrated data from environmental systems with different types of omics, imaging, biogeochemistry, isotope analysis, and, and, and many more. Um, we, sci we, we're having this webinar today to let people know about this opportunity what we call, that we call the FICUS proposal, which is a chance for scientists like you to access both the JGI and EMSL capabilities through uh, a single proposal. We call this the, the FICUS program. And, in, and as well, in addition to just being able to access JGI and EMSL, there's also the opportunity to draw on other resources like Biosans, the biological small angle neutron scattering instrument at Oak Ridge, as well as uh, the NEON, uh, as well as the NEON program. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, we're gonna hear from Kelsey Ewell and Mike San, Clement, San, San Clements about NEON and how to access those resources uh, through the FICUS proposal. And then we're also gonna hear from Jeff Blanchard about how he's been collaborating with NEON, JGI and EMSOL to address his research problems. If you're interested uh, in, in, in submitting a proposal, I wanna let you know that the letters of intent are due on March 17th, but so that's coming up quick, but remember this is just the letter of intent, not the full proposal. So. If you're uh, interested, make sure to get your foot in the door with this letter of intent. Uh, when you're doing this letter of intent, this, this part's really important. If you're interested in using the NEON resources, then you need a letter or statement of support when you submit your LOI saying that you've contacted them and, and that, it, you know, that, you're, that they can either, uh, that NEON will be able to support your request or at least in general, it sounds feasible. So please, if you're going to send your LOI and asking to use the NEON resources, please contact NEON to get some uh, support. And you can see this uh, address here, the biorepo at asu.edu. That's a great place to, to start those questions. Okay, I'm about to turn this over to Will Q. Uh, he's an EMSL scientist and member of the metabolomics team at Pacific Northwest National Lab. And he's gonna give a brief overview of the EMSL technologies that you can utilize uh, through, through that user facility. Uh, before we'll start though, I just wanna remind people if you would like to ask a question, please send it through the Q&A feature and we'll do our best to address it. Okay, Will, stage is yours. I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, you can start whenever you're ready. Okay. I hope you can all see my slides. Um, thanks, Rex, for the introduction. So yeah, I'm a staff scientist here at EMSL at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Um, as Rex stated, this is a Department of Energy user facility. So we collaborate with external users to do 
research in a collaborative sense, exploring environmental and biological related topics. So EMSL recently underwent a sort of uh, structural changes and broadly speaking, EMSL is now categorized into two science areas. These are biological or environmental. And within each of these science areas are a number of integrated research platforms or IRPs. These include uh, areas such as structural biology, cell, cellular signaling and communications, plant and ecosystem phenotyping. And these IRPs allow us to group our expertise and our instrumentation and our researchers across these different platforms in sort of reasonably well targeted and constructed uh, scientific goals. And obviously there's a lot of overlap between all of these things. And we bring them together in um, various types of um, data analysis and interpretation. What I want to really highlight are two of the main IRPs, the biomolecular pathways and the biogeochemical transformations, which lend support to the sort of projects you might do with neon samples. So biomolecular pathways is a group of techniques which really encompasses multi-omics techniques. Um, unlike the JGI, we don't really do any sort of um, the genomics level omics, but we do a lot of the metabolomics, lipidomics, and proteomics. And we've just got some really well-established ways to probe these omics within interesting biological and environmental samples, such as soils, plants, fungi, and microbes. And we can do things such as imaging with high resolution mass spectrometry, such as FDMS, uh, using MALDI as an imaging source. We've got GCMS platforms to do uh, metabolomic profiling of samples. We have solution state NMR, which has high throughput capacity and is great for looking at, again, small molecules, metabolites, those sort of characteristics. And we've got proteomics platforms, uh, which are well established using a number of different LC uh, high res mass specs to look at bottom up proteomics to really understand the uh, various biological pathways that are going on in your systems. If you have more interest, more questions for this, uh, reach out to the RP League, Mary Lipton. The other major technique uh, or IRP that we've got is biogeochemical transformations. So this one is really focused at looking at things like soil characterization, studying organic matter, the 3D microstructure, investigating mineral weathering, chemical speciation or environmental analysis, oh, sorry, in elemental analysis. Um, some of the techniques we have to support this include our uh, ultra high mass, um, ultra high resolution mass spectrometry, including the 21 Tesla FTICR mass spectrometer as well as solid state NMR and a number of other techniques um, that can provide either bulk or localized characterization of our samples. And these are really useful for studying these uh, complex soil samples. In terms of EMSL access, uh, obviously we're talking today about ways to get in through the FICUS program, but there's other programs such as large scale research and rapid access, and sometimes these names change slightly. And if you do get access into EMSL, we can help with sample preparation, with data acquisition, data analysis, and together we'll do some collaborative interpretation and hopefully lead to new scientific understanding and publications, which are always useful. And I wanted to highlight some of the FY21 FICUS awardees, just to sort of show the diversity of, of programs and, and projects which can get supported. So Vanessa Bailey, who's at the Pacific Northwest National Lab, has a project studying soil communities and high and low carbon use with different moisture treatments. Uh, Jennifer Batnagar is looking into plant mycorrhizal decomposer interactions, so uh, ectomycorrhizal fungi, for example, and how that affects the plant carbon allocation. Uh, Roland uh, Hatson Pickler and Tim McDermott are studying the uh, biogeochemical impact of methane producing bacteria. And then uh, Jeff Blanchard, who we're going to hear from later on, is working with Janet Jansen to study uh, multi-omic data sets using NEON resources. And that's really a good catalyst for the rest of today's talks. So uh, ignore what I said here about chat, use the Q&A function. And next up, I'd like to introduce uh, Kelsey Yule and Mike come to San Clements, who are going to talk a little bit more about NEON. Thank you. Um, let's see. Okay. Thanks. Go ahead and share my screen and we can get started. Okay, fantastic. So I wanted to give everyone a um, 12, 15 minute overview of NEON before we dive into some more specifics about the biorepository that will come from Kelsey. 
And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mike St. Clements, and I'm the lead terrestrial um, instrument scientist at NEON. And NEON, the goal of NEON is really to enable um, macro system scale ecological research. And so um, I often think of NEON as a platform for the community in which they can build their own research. And so at the highest level, you can think of NEON as a continental scale observatory for collecting long-term ecological data to understand how our ecosystems are changing. And we also provide to the community three key things, which are free and open data on the drivers of and responses to ecological change. And we'll learn more about those data products as we move forward. And also archive specimens. And that at this rate, Point, we're archiving about 100,000 specimens per year. And Kelsey will get a little bit more into that. So that's where the power of this collaboration comes from, as that NEON already has the specimens and the samples. And EMSL and JGI have that analytical capacity to really do some exciting science. And then we also provide a standardized framework for research and experiments, which I'll talk a little bit more to you about. So these um, are the NEON sites. This is a map of the observatory. We have 81 field sites. And that's 47 terrestrial sites and 34 aquatic sites. And they're distributed across um, 20 eco-climatic domains, which are modeled on a number of climatic um, and environmental variables to determine those and group together similar ecosystems. And our coverage spans up to Alaska, as well as into Puerto Rico and to Hawaii. And at every one of these sites, we are collecting 181 data products. And so that's one thing about NEON is that it's very standardized. So what happens at one site happens at another. And we'll be doing this over the course of 30 years. And so broadly, we collect data in three ways. We collect information about terrestrial and aquatic organisms. We collect a host of biogeochemical data and we collect physical properties such as temperature, um, precipitation, wind. And I'll just dive a little bit more into some of those. And so there's a lot to consider when you think about NEON. And this is sort of an overview of a hypothetical co-located NEON aquatic and terrestrial site. And on this page here, you can see what are the, the major subsystems within NEON. And so there's our, we're not going to dive too deep into all these, but we have things like our distributed soil sampling plots, our soil arrays that are instrumented, aquatic observations, surface water sensors, distributed plots where things like mi microbial analyses samples are collected or litter fall samples. We have an airborne flight path which flies over the site. We have tower plots which occur in the footprint of eddy covariance system, um, eddy covariance towers as well as the tower itself and the tower airshed. And then we have soil megapits. And so at the highest level, these are the fundamental um, subsystems of NEON. And within each one of these, there's um, multiple measurements made that we'll get a little bit further into. So the data collection methods, just to touch on this really quickly so people are aware of it, our airborne um, remote sensing department collects high resolution camera data, hyperspectral data, and waveform LIDAR data at each one of our sites, or is the best they can each year, to get each one of our sites every year at peak greenness. And so we fly the entire site and collect all that information. We also have our aquatic sites, which I showed in that previous map. And this is just diving a little deeper into one of those. So either whether it be a weightable stream, a non-weightable river, or a lake, we have some similarities, which are we have um, a met station next to the stream, lake, or river. We have um, buoys or in-stream sensors measuring a host of things. And then we collect samples of sediments, macroinvertebrates, plants, water for biogeochemical analyses. And I'll talk a little bit more as we move forward about how to find all this data. Because like I said, there's a lot to drill down into, and I can't really go through it all in 15 minutes. At each one of our terrestrial sites, um, we make a host of terrestrial um, measurements with sensors. And you can see this drone photo right here of the CEPR site in Colorado. And you can see the tower and then our five instrumented soil plots, which would be occurring in the footprint of the flux tower. There would also be the instrument hut near the tower, which would house all the instrumentation, as well as a precipitation gauge here. And so this is sort of how each one of the sites, whether it be in a forest or on a rangeland, um, are laid out at NEON. You have a tower that is dependent upon the height of the um, local vegetation with our flux systems and then soil instrumentation going out from there. And around that instrumentation is where all of the um, grab samples for microbes and archives are collected from and biogeochemical analyses and plant diversity, et cetera. And so to continue to dig down and think about soil a little bit more, um, here's sort of a plot of what NEON has from the perspective of 
um, soils. And you can see that there's a range of depths we cover. So our soil samples within the observatory go from 30 centimeters all the way down to two meters. And they occur on a range of measurements from um, you know, one time in the history of the 30 year observatory to um, every minute. And so I wanted to take a little bit of time and um, teach you a little bit more about what occurs in these. So we had two phases to our initial site characterization and soil pits, and that's two efforts. And there's the mega pit and our initial characterization with the NRCS. And the mega pit was a one per site, um, two meter deep, very large um, pit that was dug to collect samples for um, calibrating our soil sensors and measuring the diffusivity of um, the soil for CO2 fluxes. And then also to feed the broader um, neon megapit archive. So we have 3.2 kilograms of soil from each horizon across the entire network in the megapit archives that can be accessed for research. And then we did an initial characterization with the NRCS, which was 10 to 34 additional plots per site, which was down to one meter deep to um, answer questions about heterogeneity of soils across the site. And so those um, data um, are available via our data portal, which I'll show you in a moment, as well as the actual physical samples themselves can be accessed. And we've sent out over 1,600 um, megapit archive samples at this point to the community. Um, and all of these samples were also an analyzed for soil texture, bulk density, carbon nitrogen, cation exchange capacity, et cetera, and described in concert with the um, NRCS protocols. And we also do, as you saw in that previous graph, um, periodic measurements of soil. And here I'm gonna focus on the periodic microbial measurements. And these are captured from what are called distributed plots. So they are distributed across a broader site, both within the footprint of the flux tower and then out for up to a range of several square kilometers or multiple square kilometers. And these occur one to three times per year um, at some soil depths and much less frequent at other soil depths. So the important thing to understand here is that NEON is, does have the potential to generate quite a bit of data for each site in addition to the archive samples that are living at the biorepository. And so these data are things like 16S, ITS, shotgun metagenome sequences, um, TLFA, and more. And um, like I said, it's difficult to dive too deeply into these things in a few minutes. So I will show you in a moment how to look at this on the um, data portal and see where to get that. And like I mentioned before, um, in addition to the biorepository, we have a, um, the megapit soil archive, um, the initial characterization of the soil um, sites. And then we have archives of the um, periodic biogeochemical sampling and the periodic microbial soil sampling, which go to the biorepository and we can touch on more in a little bit. These quantities vary across um, what is available. So the key to navigating this process and understanding, beginning to think about what samples you might want to request from the Pyro repository and how you might frame your study is to find all this complementary information. And this should be get, have gotten a little bit easier recently in that we um, just over the last couple of months have completely redesigned our um, website and portal. And so that website is neonscience.org and it will take you to the data portal and all these other things we'll touch on. And what we did was we sort of revamped our website to go from a construction delivery focused where you sort of had to already know what was going on in the observatory to sort of an operations and community focused menu where we're thinking about things like user resources and data and samples. So it should be easier to go to the um, NEON website now and start diving down in and finding what you need. And so we included enhancements um, like these data portal enhancements where we rebuilt the field site map. So now we have, um, as you can see here on the right, we have um, our field site map. You can continue to zoom in across the observatory now to any at any one of our sites. You can zoom all the way down, see all of the different sampling plots that occur at that site, and um, just really detail down into the site and see where things are occurring. And we also integrated these into field site detail pages, which now have um, an embedded map with every type of sampling, the frequencies. You can also go in and get um, background data on climate and geology, as well as downloadable tables of site characteristics. And so you can really start to understand what is going on at which site and where on the landscape as you start to think about your research. And you can also bounce back and forth now between the NEON site. So if you're on NEON and you're thinking broadly like, hey, do they do any research on birds? you'll now be able to go straight from that into the data portal and begin downloading that data. So it should be a much easier um, experience for people who are interested in looking. 
And so if you were to go to the data portal now um, and say, start looking for what soil of data you might, um, Neon might have collected and processed in addition to the archive samples, you can now um, dig in and start doing keyword searches and you'll see the different um, data products that come up the dark and you'll see when those were collected and processed in a little bar on the side there. Um, you can um, even plot these and do time series analysis right in the um, data portal itself now. And you can now register for a free account. You don't need an account to access Neon data at this point, but if you do register for a free account, you can be updated when additional data is generated and processed and put into these data products. So, um, and also now our documentation is easier to find. So there's user guides, abbreviated user guides for each data product, which will tell you what they are and how to use them. And this is just a quick example of how you can begin to look at um, the sensor data and even plot it. Here is an example of just um, some data from the Abbey Road site and plotted in the data portal. And you can start to look at that before you go ahead and download. With all that said, Neon doesn't do everything. And I think of Neon as a platform for people's research. And in order to really truly be that platform, there needs to be an inroad for people to build onto the, the observatory and do more work. And so I wanted to touch really quickly on our assignable assets program, because if there's something you're interested in um, including in a sample set, but it's not present in the bioarchive, but you really need some additional information from a NEON site to pull off of a project, the Assignable Assets Program is where you would go. And that's, what that does is it makes, basically makes available certain components of NEON's infrastructure and staff to members of the community to support their own research and activities. And so the guiding principles of our Assignable Assets Program are to allow people to leverage NEON infrastructure and um, create community engagement opportunities, to avoid conflicts with NEON's mission and scope while doing that, so to not jeopardize our core measurements, to avoid interference with current NEON measurements, and um, to, by NSF mandate, support this on a cost recoverable basis, basis which means we will work with you to include um, costs in, into a proposal if you have a big project you want to incorporate. That being said, smaller projects can often be done um, under our small awards and can fly through um, with just um, the core small awards neon funding. And so there's three main process to this. It's a feasibility and technical review, a pricing and a cost of the project, and then initiating and getting it done. And so the things that can happen under this are, um, you can leverage our um, observational system and get additional samples. You can even request the airborne um, flights somewhere else. You can um, coordinate with the field sites to visit and sample yourself. You can request excess samples from our program sampling. You can add additional sensors to our towers. You can request a mobile deployment platform. And also we facilitate letters of support and collaboration as well as sampling permits and permissions. And it's more than just assets. One of the key things to understand is that our field and HQ staff are already distributed across the continent, all these sites. And as part of the Assignable Assets Program, they can go out and collect data for you in the field and ship it to you, which can be really um, pretty efficient when you think about the large distributed nature of NEON. And so there's three phases, which is planning is really important. So if you have an idea and you want to do this for a letter of collaboration or anything, we always recommend reaching out to Neon as soon as possible. Phase two is sort of the agreement where we decide, can that be done? And to this point, out of um, all the assignable assets requests we have received, we have only had to reject one that we couldn't figure out a way to make feasible. So we are doing our best to get this happening. And phase three is implementation. And our communications with you, the investigator, are key at the center of all this. And so to initiate this AA process and learn more about it, you want to visit the research support and assignable assets um, part of the NEON website. And that address is right here. And this is the page. You can get there pretty easily. And just to, before I finish and turn it over to Kelsey, this is just an example um, right now. People have installed antennas for bird tracking at our site in Hawaii. Um, people are looking at aerial dispersal and fungal movement across a number of sites. Um, this is a pretty exciting project. So they're installing their own samplers at um, NEON sites and the adding additional sensors for solar induced chlorophyll fluorescence um, at neon sites and on the towers. And I just wanna end before I turn it over to Kelsey with this, that um, if you look at this list of things that occur in the biorepository and the neon archives, you might notice that you know water, just fundamental like stream water is missing. And so the AA project would be, the AA program would be a great avenue to, whereby researchers could coordinate grabbing samples of water from neon um, aquatic sites with our technicians. And that's why I think knowing about these things is really important. 
And so with that, I will end and turn it over to you, Kelsey. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kelsey Ewell. I'm the project manager for the Neon Bio Repository. And I want to point out uh, my contact information at the bottom here, kmewell at asu.edu. So please do contact me with any questions after, um, after the presentation. So I like to just start by um, explaining physically what the Neon Bio Repository is. We are part of the Arizona State University Biodiversity Knowledge Integration Center, and we are located at the Natural History Collections at ASU. And most likely, most of the samples that this audience will be interested in are what we call cryo samples, so samples that are temperature controlled. Um, so this is a new facility, and I just want to let you all know what it looks like so you know where uh, samples are coming from that you might uh, be interested in. So we have built out this new uh, facility with liquid nitrogen freezers, a processing lab, an ultra low uh, freezer farm as well. But uh, whether those are cryo samples or not, we're receiving and archiving and making available for research neon samples every day. These samples are taxonomically diverse. Uh, like Mike said, we're getting over 100,000 of them every year of about 65 different classes or collections that we're managing and we're storing them under conditions that are uh, meant to uh, maximize their long-term data potential. So about 60% of them are going into that cryo facility. Some of them look like uh, natural history collections uh, samples that you might expect like uh, Prestervarium vouchers. Others um, look a bit different, like frozen tissues or DNA samples, bulk community level samples, and environmental samples. This is a broad level overview, um, not enough time to read all of this, obviously, of the different types of samples that we have. Um, and I'll just dig into a couple of different microbial and environmental samples since they might be of most interest here. So for soils, um, so Mike showed a, a good breakdown of kind of uh, the spatial and temporal spread of sampling for a lot of these things. Um, but I also wanted to give kind of a, an overview of just the scale of the number of samples that we're getting every year. So we do get these air dried soil core samples, about 400 of those every year. Um, and they're sampled once every five years at peak greenness at all of the terrestrial sites. And I won't have time to talk about um, the megapit soil samples that actually are still um, housed with neon, um, litter fall samples, below ground biomass samples, et cetera. But these are all um, dry samples, dry environmental samples that we're able to make available. Um, soil microbes make up a huge portion of our collection. Uh, we get 20,000 of these bulk soil microbe samples every year that are stored in liquid nitrogen. Um, we get uh, these samples from mineral and organic horizons. And we also get um, already extracted soil microbe DNA samples that we store at minus 80. Um, we get aquatic microbes as well, um, both benthic and uh, surface um, and on Sterevex filters um, in bulk and already extracted. The benthic aquatic macro microbes come from the weightable streams and they're collected three times per year from different substrates. Um, and they number uh, 300 to 800 per year, depending upon which class you're talking about. The surface microbes are similar. Um, they come from all of the aquatic sites and they're uh, sampled more frequently, although obviously not from different substrates. And we get 300 to 400 of those um, for each of these classes or collections. We also get atmospheric deposition samples, both dry, so particulate mass filters and wet, um, so wet deposition collected from precipitation events, 
uh, I won't go into the where these samples are collected and how many we have um, for the sake of time. We also have um, our bio repository data portal, um, biorepo.neonscience.org, where you can find information about all of these collections and look at what samples we have available. So this is a symbiota-based data portal. That's a um, very commonly used software platform for natural history collections. Um, and with this type of portal, you can learn about our samples, download sample data, search for and map samples, initiate your sample loans and letter of support or collaboration requests, um, read the sample and data use policies. And then when you um, create data based off of sample use, you can then um, contribute that and publish it back into our portal to make it available to the public. So um, I don't have time to talk about how to search for samples, but this getting started uh, tab on our portal is um, really useful, has uh, both tutorials and FAQs. So the most important thing um, for the purpose of this uh, webinar is really how do you request samples or get these letters of support from us? So you can go to the sample use tab and see um, the, the policies associated with that. If you already have a really good idea of what you want, you know you need X number of samples from Y number of sites of, of this type, you can go ahead and fill out our sample use request form, even if you're just looking for a letter of support at this point. Um, and, you, and you don't need like a, a list of sample IDs to do that. If not, uh, go ahead and email us um, at my contact information that I gave before or at biorepo at asu.edu. Um, and we can work all of that out. We're really happy to work really closely with you on that. And note that when you're searching the portal, only our fully checked in and vetted and curated samples are visible. Um, we may already have more that meet your needs or um, know that more are coming. So um, I don't think you can see any um, like aquatic DNA extracts yet in the portal, but we do have those and we know that more are coming. So go ahead and contact us if you're interested. And please reach out as early as possible in the process of um, proposal preparation. Um, we do need time to determine what the appropriate samples are. It may be that, um, we need to go to NEON to look at one of the, for one of these assignable asset requests because you need more samples or they're not collected in the right way for your project. Um, destructive use of samples is common and we do it, um, but depending upon the, um, like the volume of samples that you need to destroy for your analyses, we do sometimes need to get that approved. And um, we may need to develop, depending upon the um, magnitude of the request, we may need to develop a budget for cost recovery. But um, at the point of the, uh, the, the time point of the letter of intent, we can do something fairly general there. But those are things that um, do have to happen before a full proposal at least is submitted. So with that, I'll just stress again that um, you can contact us at biorepo at asu.edu. And with that, um, I will pass it over to Jeff Blanchard, who has um, um, been, been giving us a, a case study of how to use these NEON samples in, in research. Okay, thank you, Kelsey and Mike. The new data portals look really great, and um, the tools also associated with them look good. So I haven't had a chance to explore those yet. Um, but I'm going to be talking about two separate ficus projects. I've been really fortunate. We had one funded three, four years ago now, based on our work at Harvard Forest, and then one that was just funded, sort of the neon ficus one. And so I'll talk about what we've done in the first one the first part of this, and then the second part, talk about the NEON um, ficus proposal and where we're going with that and some of the ideas around that. So this is a fun little cartoon that one of my, the students in my lab put together. 
kind of like the, the doing the cool omics work that you get to do at JGI and EMSL. Um, my work at Harvard Forest has been largely based on some warming plots established by Jerry Melillo way back in 1991. Jerry's a true visionary um, in this field. Um, these plots, the newest one was established in 2006 by Sarita Frey, and Sarita is now um, maintaining and overseeing these um, plots as we go forward. So the data that I'm talking about is from the Berry Woods experimental plot. Um, the temperature in the warming plot is five degrees above the control plot all year round. And these are bigger 30 by 30 meter um, plots. The um, Berry Woods, there's Jerry showed in a PNS paper, and this is when I first became associated with it that there's been a net carbon loss in the soil in response to long-term experimental warming. And this is sort of when I joined the project as part of being a Harvard Forest uh, Bullard Fellow. And I met both Jerry and I met some of the initial people involved with establishing the Harvard Forest NEON sites. So it was a very fortunate time in my career. And so the our 2017 FICUS Award is centered around an experiment at Berry Woods where we um, measured soil. Um, we turned off the temperature at the beginning of the summer and took samples at that time point. We actually took samples throughout this time series and then turned the temperature back on in mid-September. And so a lot of the work that I'm talking about is from this initial period before we took off, uh, turned off the heat, but we've got other samples that we're working on from this other time period. Um, we've already published three papers from this project, and so I'm not going to talk about them at all. Um, two of them are from using cell sorted genomics, metagenomics, metatranscriptomics with JGI. And again, really great to work with. We've discovered some really cool things, including giant viruses, vampire bacteria, a lot of bizarre things in the soil. And then some of the work. Um, at PNNL EMSL related to mass spectroscopy um, and the techniques that they have there. And that's what I'm going to be talking more about um, right now. So one of the cool things with doing the FTI CR MS is that you can see thousands, actually tens of thousands of different molecules in the soil at the same time. It's pretty welding, especially for microbiologists like me, but fortunately, um, EMSL really helps in, in doing the um, data analysis and interpretation of that. And it sort of leaves me to looking at the difference between the warm plots. I also had a very talented uh, graduate student, um, William Rodriguez, working on it, who did an internship at, at EMSL as part of it. That's something to, to think about, too. So one of the things that we see is so we see a lot of different compounds. And if we look at the organic layer, we see that there are many more compounds sort of unique to the control than there are to the warmed plot, suggesting these molecules have disappeared in response to long-term warming. So it's what we might expect that there's some of these that have been metabolized and metabolized more quickly. But what we didn't expect was that the mineral layer, we saw the opposite. There are more unique compounds in the heated than in the control. And I'm not gonna really get into breaking it apart but we can see that there are a lot of molecules common between all four of these different treatments. Um, and heated and organic share a lot, as you might expect, because there's a lot more molecules in the organic layer than there is in the heated, uh, than there is in the mineral layer. But surprisingly, there are a lot of unique molecules in the heated mineral, and then a lot of shared ones between the heated mineral, organic, and control that aren't in the control mineral. And so we're right now testing different hypotheses for why this is. It could involve SOM transformation or changes in the biota, or actually more mixing of the soil layers as well. So there's a lot to this. You can dive down into it. I'm just showing a really high level view of the data where you can look at the number of molecules in these different categories, and we can see significant differences in these molecules. We also did soil lipids or lipid omic analysis. And we see a lot of 
uh, changes. Uh, mostly they're changes that result in decreased amounts of lipids in the heated relative to the control. And this is with, consistent with some of Sarita Frey's work showing a decrease in microbial biomass um, in this, in the uh, heated plots. We can also look at soil metabolites. Again, mostly we see metabolites um, dropping. They're higher in the control or the lower in the heated relative to control, as we might expect if there's a lower biomass and there's more um, of the unique compounds being metabolized in the heated plots. So it becomes kind of interesting to look at what's going up in the heated. And we see maltotriose and sulfurose. And so sulfurose is really interesting because it's uh, actually an inducer of cellulase pr uh, production. And so we don't know if that's what's going on in the warmed plots, but that's that one. This leads to a hypothesis that there's an increased amount of degradation of cellul cellulose and some of the other harder to use compounds in the warmed plots. We can see connections between the metabolites and the um, metatranscriptomics data. Um, we see maltose come up as one of the ones that goes up in heated. And considering we also see an increase in metabolites, suggest an increase in flux through maltose related pathways. And we can see other um, biogeochemical bio cycles pathways in the metatranscriptomics data that was produced by JGI. It's actually really beautiful insight into some of the changes that are happening. And then we can put these, integrate the mass spec data with the metatranscriptomics data and get into a lot of complicated networks that I'm not going to go into today. But one of the surprising things was that we can actually link a, a lot of different compounds to enzymes, many more than I would have expected um, going into this. So we ex we've got two more papers, probably actually we've got four more papers coming out of this project, three are that are in draft stage now. So one of the things when you do this, you're going to get a lot of data, you can ask a lot of questions, and you've got a lot of data analysis and writing to do. So with this in hand, I got a, um, a year ago, actually two years ago now, I've got a working group together to look at um, sort of challenges in soil, um, doing soil metagenomic related research. And one of the problems with doing soils is when you do soil metagenomes, there are very few genome bins or metagenome assembled genomes that come out of it. And it's very hopeful that with new techniques, we'll see an increase in the amount of mags that come out of soil metagenomic studies. And so I get together a working group um, consisting of Janet Jansen, George Rodriguez, Jason McDermott, uh, Lee Stanish with the time was at Neon, and Margaret O'Brien, and a number of other really great scientists. And so one of the aims of this was to develop a reference database of these ecological genomes, including those from NEON, and to see if we could use this to get more specific insight out of metagenomic and metatranscriptomics data. Again, I'm going to put a plug in for JGI here. Some of the work that I've done with Rex and Tanya and some of the analyses that Frederick Schultz did that led to the discovery of the giant viruses is through this really cool technique, which especially if you're a soil microbiologist is, is really amazing in that you, we can actually do um, sorting of single cells and basically do a variant of single cell genomics and get reference genomes. We actually pooled 100 cells into a well to increase the cost efficiency of this process, and we can recover a lot more mags than we can looking at metagenomes as a whole, and we get really interesting insights into unusual microbes that come up. So it's very interested in going and repeating this on different soil samples with uh, different ways of filtering. Um, and so when the Neon Ficus Award came up, it was sort of a purpose, pr a great opportunity to leverage some of the technology at JGI and EMSL that we've been working with, with some of the work that we do at Harvard Forest. Harvard Forest, fortunately, is a NEON site, so it's easy for me to put it in there, that context, but to look at a bigger picture 
challenge. Instead of looking at our warming plots, to look at soil temperature moisture gradients across forested neon sites to test hypotheses related to biodiversity and microbial response traits. And so in this, we're leveraging the capabilities at JGI and EMSL. We are also leveraging NEON's data um, soil repository, getting samples from there, as well as the data products that they produce from the, the metagenomics, the 16S, the IT analysis. And it's really great. NEON's now got a five-year timeline of this. We're doing our study looking um, more across um, geographical space um, in this, but there's still a fairly big uh, scope that you can do in these studies, much bigger than maybe in a typical NSF award. So one of the key things that might, might not need to do now with the new um, NEON data portal and tools, but we had to go in and pull out the NEON soil repository data and sort of get into it and find these relationships that we wanted to use to put into our proposal and which samples we wanted to choose. And so we were looking for a gradient of soil moisture and temperature that we're able to pull out. And actually the R scripts are available on our emergent GitHub site. Please uh, email me if you're interested in, well, you can just go and use them, but if you're interested in um, how to use them or questions related to that, please let me know. But being able to do that, to look at these gradients, know that there's soil data there, there's already microbial data there, and then I can use that to leverage in the ficus proposal. Just made it, you know, I wouldn't say easy, but you know, to do something at this scale is, is to me kind of mind blowing um, to be working at uh, this. And then to go back and work with JGI and MSOL again. So some of the advantages of working with NEON data products. So their measurements are made using validated methods across space and time. For somebody who does long-term ecological research at Harvard Forest, all the sites have their own way of measuring and their own specific questions they're asking. So that justifies the different techniques, but it's hard to compare across space and time because of that. And there's now a five-year timeline available for NEON data sets. As you heard, there's soil and other samples available. And there's the possibility of collecting additional samples if you want to include those into your study design. And to me, and this is what I'm starting to go down this route now, it opens the possibility of collaborating with scientists working with other NEON data sets at the same site that I might not, I definitely would not do normally. But now we can look at the relationship between microbes and, and other organisms or atmospheric parameters. And of course, this is really great for leveraging for DOE and NSF proposals. So why work through the, the FICUS program? Um, I would say the number one reason is the people are amazing. There's just totally outstanding scientists at JGI and EMSL. There's people with project management experience. There's people with textbook, technical expertise in preparing samples for these different technologies. There's the data processing bioinformatics side, and then some of their science capabilities. They're not just technical people, but they're very engaged scientists interested in what many of us in this community are doing. And that led uh, Frederick Schultz to discover um, giant viruses in some of our data sets working with us. Um, so my, my lab can do some of these things at some level, but the way I look at it is that JGI and EMS will have professional stuff and they can do it better than I could ever do. And this allows me to put my resources elsewhere from my grants. And some tips for submitting a successful proposal is one, communicate with JGI and EMSL at all stages. They're really helpful, knowledge of people. They've seen things, they have ideas on how to do things differently. If you have some new concept or way of looking at it, they're usually really excited to work with you about that. I would say, dream, you know, don't be afraid of discovery projects, just define this discovery space and why it's an excellent opportunity to sort of do that. But it's also very good to have some testable hypotheses to help frame your proposal. Have well-formed data analysis plans, 
again, this is where it's really helpful to work with JGI and MSOL who are experts in this. And then a clear vision of at least one and probably multiple impactful manuscripts that help the reviewer see where this is going. And then write it like a grant proposal, not a fill in the blank application. Uh, okay, so a lot of people have gone into working on these different projects and I'm definitely very grateful for the staff at JGI and PNNL and for NEON for creating this very valuable resource. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. That was uh, great to hear about how you've been uh, using some of the resources here. I'm going to invite uh, Mike and Kelsey and Will to come back online to answer uh, some questions here. But just as an aside, I, you know, I, when I look at this and I think back to the amount of field work I did as a graduate student and a postdoc, and all the headaches and logistical problems and costs that go into that. I, I just love this idea of being able to draw on the neon resources to get samples from places I wouldn't be able to go and, and have them sort of embedded in this other metadata world and all those other, anyway, to help put them in context. So I think this is actually a pretty cool thing. Um, yeah. All right, guys. Uh, so here are a few questions that have come in. Um, so first, uh, I actually have a, a couple specific questions here. So this one's for Mike. Uh, for the assignable assets project, does the data produced become public? Um, so that's an interesting question. And so currently we don't have a method um, at NEON to ingest data external to the community, even if it's collected in a NEON site. So we don't host that data back. So we would ask that you make it public and we would recommend that maybe it go to um, like the environmental science data initiative EDI or somewhere else or whatever um, you know um, repository you would typically use and let us know but we don't host the data beyond that so yep we don't force you to but we obviously want people to publicize neon data yep. okay um, if it's data associated with a particular sample, we are able and definitely encourage um, you to uh, let us link to that in the sample record so that it would be public to other people interested. Okay. On the, on the biorepository portal in particular. Kelsey, I also have a specific question uh, saying, are there plans to collect RNA samples from soil or surfaces or, or any of the microbiome focused collections? Uh, well, that's probably better directed towards Mike. Um, yeah. We Mike, just uh, plans to co collect yeah, RNA yes. in addition to DNA? Um, I'm not certain if we are going to or not. It's um, a tough one because we are collecting as many samples as we can for the microbial work and sort of um, trying to walk that line in the past and what we're going to just archive and let people do what they want versus what we are going to be processing. So I think the best thing to do is stay tuned in the coming future and see how that evolves as we move forward. Okay. Yeah. Now, say for my project, I'm getting the soil samples and extracting the RNA and then sending the RNA to JGI that make, which makes the libraries and does the sequencing. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, let's see, um, another question here about the biorepository. So what if the biorepository doesn't have enough of the samples types that I need for my project? Are there any yeah. options? That would absolutely be a great thing to go through the NEON Assignable Assets Program for. Um, and I can't speak for them, but that I feel like that's one of those situations where an assignable asset request can be pretty reasonable. Grab me two of those instead of one, and they can they can look at that request, right? Yeah, that's a great example. Like we had um, a PhD student from Oregon State who was doing some work and was a little bit short on some soils from neon sites and was able to ask the neon field techs via the AA program to just grab those soils for them. So that's a perfect example of a time to call upon the AA program to potentially just fill that gap for you. Thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, I have another question here for you. So how do we 
how would people find out more about the sampling protocols that NEON uses so they can better understand what's in the repository? Yeah, so I think a really great place to start is if you go to the NEON website and you click the data and resources tab, eventually you'll end up at the um, NEON data portal. And when you search for, um, say, the word soil and you see all the data products come up, if you click into a data product, you'll you'll be able to read an overview of that data product as well as download the protocols and the user guide that tells you how that was collected, um, how it's processed, et cetera. And then similarly for instrumentation, you can actually click in and get the um, ATBD, which is the algorithm basis theoretical document, which describes the entire algorithm used to process that data and generate it. So that would all come along. And if you download the data, you can actually just download those documents right along with the data sets. So you have all that information. Thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, one last question here. Uh, and just it's to reemphasize a point that we were trying to make, which is that the for the proposals that want to use the NEON resources, they need uh, some a letter of support from NEON. And so uh, can you just remind people how to go about getting that letter of support? Yeah, Kelsey, do you want to speak to this one just from the bio, if we're assuming that someone's going straight to the bio repository without needing to collect additional NEON? I can right, yeah, so if you don't need uh, Neon to do anything else and you just need samples that we have, if you know, if you have a good idea of what you want, um, just go right to the sample use request form. You don't have to have that list of sample IDs, but um, you can, um, that's the easiest place to start from our perspective. Uh, but we're also happy to completely work with you kind of from step one if you contact us at biorepo at asu.edu and we'll, um, you know, sometimes it's just like, oh, that's, that's obvious, that's easy, here's your letter. And then sometimes it's, okay, well, let's really dig in and see if we have exactly what you need. And um, is that going to be something where we need to think about it, that it's um, uh, going to be destructive of too much of the collection because um, a lot of these analyses we understand require destruction of the samples and that's like built into the purpose of collecting them and archiving them but also we want to um, maintain a spatio-temporal distribution of samples you know across the 30 years as um, people are going to come up with new analyses that they want to do with them. So that's an important thing that we need to consider before we can give a letter as well. And it has someone else already asked for these samples. These are reasons why, um, you know, just coming straight to us is the best thing to do. And if you did want or potentially need um, additional resources beyond the biorepository, the um, Assignable Assets Program would again be the place to go to initiate that. And as Kelsey mentioned, it, it scales with the degree of complexity of the request, right? If you just wanted a little bit of water or a little bit of soil from one or two or sites, then it's much more simple than if you wanted, um, you know, 30 terrestrial sites and multiple plots in those sites, then that's a bigger request. And you have to, you have to consider the timing and priorities of our field science staff already. So, but for most things, it can be fairly streamlined. Thank you guys. That was great. Yeah. Uh, that was the, all the time that we had for questions. So Jeff, Kelsey, Mike, Will, thank you very much for, uh, for taking the time to present today. Just a quick reminder uh, that the letters of intent are due on March 17th, but remember that's just the letters of intent. Find out more about the, uh, these, um, the, these programs. You can find out at the JGI or the EMSL website. And once again, here's the contact info for Neon, if you're interested in getting a letter of support. Real quick, I just want to mention to, to people that next week we have a few more webinars. There are two tutorials about uh, phycocosm and mycocosm uh, databases, as well as webinar from uh, regarding using, using long read sequencing for metagenomics and DNA modification detection. So if you're interested, please join us for that. And finally, uh, you can follow us at a, a lot of the, uh, the normal places, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube. We have some podcasts. Uh, you can also use these emails to get onto our email list to find out more information.
All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. We're going to record this. Uh, we're going to take your answers, uh, put them online and share them uh, with other people. If you have any more, please feel free to reach out to people on the panel or JGI or EMSL in any way, and we're going to be happy to answer your questions. All the best. Take care. That's it for now. Bye-bye.